Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Guy Sherwood, and I am a 20-year survivor of Waldens from macroglobulinemia. Today, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Stephen Trion of the Bing Center for Waldenstrom Macroglobulinemia at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. Today, Dr. Trion will share a lot of history about the progress in research in our rare disease with a special presentation on improving outcomes through discovery. Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. At the conclusion of this lecture, Dr. Trion will answer as many questions from the audience that we have time for. So thank you, enjoy the lecture, and over to you, Dr. Trion. Greetings, my name is Stephen Trion. I'm a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and the director of the Bing Center for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston. I was tasked by both Carl Harrington as well as Tom Hoffman uh, to talk today about improving patient outcomes through discovery uh, for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. In this uh, next slide are my disclosures. And I always like uh, starting off um, my presentations by talking about Ian Waldenstrom. Uh, Jan Waldenstrom was first to describe this condition that we know today as Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia uh, in his publication that appeared in 1944 in Acta Medica Scandinavica. But it's important, I think, for all of us to recognize that a large gap of time actually went by before people began to uh, recognize that Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia was in fact its own uh, pathological entity. In fact, many people at that time thought that this was a disease that was a disease much like um, that of multiple myeloma, except that it had you know, its own uh, intricacies. And so this is back now in 1943, 1944, that he describes Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Um, and it actually wasn't until 1950 that uh, Tischendorf uh, made the, um, the insight that mast cells were being uh, found in excess numbers in the bone marrows of patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. That actually was very pivotal because it was the first recognition that there was this pathological entity associated with what Jan Waldenstrom had described. In 1962, the Masari brothers then described a familial a form of Waldenstrom's where multiple siblings actually had macroglobulinemia. And as you can see, as the disease became recognized, then a number of therapeutic um, modalities were introduced, new drugs, uh, including uh, chlorambucil um, being first introduced in 1961. In 1978 came along the understanding that IgM MGUS was actually a predisposition for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And my wonderful mentor and um, colleague, uh, Bob Kyle, made this uh, observation. And then we began to see the nucleoside analogs, um, predominantly being developed um, at the MD Anderson, initially by Hago uh, Kantarjian, but then uh, my other friend and colleague, uh, Thanos Demopoulos, who then also helped develop 2CDA. Um, which is another nucleoside analog. And of course, my friend and colleague, uh, Veronique Leblond, expanded uh, this um, understanding of the role of fludarabine through studies done in France as part of the French co-op studies uh, in the late 1990s. And it was about this time that we had made the important observation that rituximab, uh, the monoclonal antibody, was active in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And this, of course, you know, heralded a number of other studies uh, that we'll talk a little bit about in just a moment, combining with rituximab with a number of uh, many of the uh, agents that are used today. But I think it is important to also recognize that despite the fact that we're moving along in the development of um, new drugs for this disease, we still lacked no uh, published diagnostic criteria for what was Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. In addition, we had no criteria to treat. 
So there were many times patients who didn't require treatment who were asymptomatic that were being treated. Uh, in addition, there were no treatment guidelines. So there was no guidance that existed out there on how to go about treating a patient with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Uh, and even perhaps, um, you know, more to the reality, we didn't even have response criteria. We didn't really know how to categorize how a patient did after receiving drug therapy. And this is why what um, Judith May and uh, Bruce Chesson did in 2000 was very, very important. And that was bringing together experts for the first international workshop on Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia that occurred in Washington, D.C. And this was the first time that experts actually got together to talk about this disease. Now, what I will tell you ended up happening at the end of that meeting was the fact that we all agreed that these were the things that we were lacking, diagnostic criteria, criteria to treat, treatment guidelines, response criteria. And I think we also agreed that we needed to work together to be able to act on these very important omissions that existed up to that point in time. Now, I think many of you are going to recognize Arnie Smokler uh, in this uh, picture, uh, the founder of the IWMF. And I, Arnie was a wonderful friend who I would spend countless hours on the phone talking to him about macroglobulinemia. He was very supportive of uh, the work that I had embarked on at that time, which was to develop and expand antibody-based therapies uh, for treating uh, Waldenstrom's patients. And I was the fortunate recipient in January of 2000 to receive um, a, uh, a, a grant from the IWMF uh, which you see here, um, which was to look at treatments of Waldenstrom's by antibody-treated mediated um, immunotherapy and induction of tumor-selective uh, antigens. And this actually was a very important grant because it gave me the opportunity to be able to study the role of rituxin as well as other monoclonal antibodies for treating this disease. Now, as I alluded to, a lot happened soon after we began to recognize the activity of rituximab in Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Um, we began to conduct uh, a number of other studies, which included studies looking at the role of CHOP plus rituxin, uh, the role of extended rituxin. We also looked at thalidomide and lenalidomide combinations with rituxin. We also combined fludarabine and rituxin in a large international study. We were the first to report on the role of Velcade along with Velcade dexamethasone and rituximab. And soon thereafter, we also uh, published our studies on alentuzumab, which is also known as CAMPATH. We were the first to actually publish on the role of bendamustine and rituximab in combination. We also published um, the first study on maintenance rituximab. And then came the study of pomalidomide, dexamethasone, and rituxin. And throughout these years, going from 1999 all the way to 2012, we also made some very interesting observations, including that rituxin could cause the IgM flare, which we published back in 2004. In 2005, we also found that patients actually had a genetic uh, background that determined how well they responded to rituximab. These were the FC gamma R3A polymorphisms. And then, of course, in 2011, we also published on the importance of achieving at least a very good partial response in order to predict long-term response to rituximab-based therapy. Throughout this entire period of time, as we developed uh, these new therapeutic uh, modalities, the IWMF was a a wonderful partner uh, in being able to fund and support uh, these uh, very important and critical uh, clinical studies and clinical observations. And I just wanted to share with you some uh, photos because uh, this will actually show the wonderful relationship that uh, the Bing Center had with the IWMF. Uh, here we're you know, uh, at the um, IWMF meeting in 2002 um, we see here my wonderful friend, uh, Ben Root, who was the president at the time. But what we had done at that meeting was we actually organized a uh, clinic where we were actually drawing blood from the patients and we were looking at their medical history and their outcome with certain therapeutics. And this was very important because it was really those blood draws and our ability to do uh, the genomics that made us understand uh, 
how important the polymorphisms uh, in the FC gamma R3A receptor were to actually forecasting how a patient would do with rituximab based therapy. Now, given the fact that we still had a lot of unanswered questions and there was a necessity for us to continue the workshop process, we organized in 2002 the second international workshop on Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. The IWMF was very, very pivotal in the organization of this uh, workshop in Athens, Greece. And here I'm uh, actually showing this very nice picture of uh, Ben Rood. And uh, these are uh, pictures um, from the closing ceremony, which was, uh, took place at the Acropolis uh, in Athens. You can see, in fact, that we had a uh, wonderful turnout for this meeting. Um, 56 investigators who represented multiple uh, countries came together. And I had the privilege of organizing this meeting along with uh, Bob Kyle and Thanos Demopoulos. And you can see here uh, in the screen, uh, the small room where we all sat for several days as we went about developing uh, the important uh, criteria that really even today are pivot points uh, in the treatment and management of patients for, uh, with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And these were published in seminars in uh, oncology and included the diagnostic criteria for Waldenstrom, the criteria to initiate treatment, treatment guidelines, as well as uh, response uh, criteria uh, for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Now, of course, uh, the Waldenstrom's workshops um, have continued since that time. Uh, what is wonderful to just um, you know, share with you is how these uh, workshops have continued to grow. This is the um, uh, third international workshop, which took place uh, in uh, Paris in 2004. And you can see that the family of investigators uh, grew during this period of time. And uh, this was a meeting that I helped um, organize along with my uh, colleagues, uh, Jean-Paul Fremond, Véronique Leblonde, as well as um, uh, Pierre uh, Morel. In this next slide, we see that the family continues to grow. This is the fifth international workshop on Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia that took place actually in Stockholm, Sweden. And this was our closing ceremonies in the Nobel Hall, where we had the opportunity uh, to honor um, the uh, wonderful work of Jan Waldenstrom, and we had many members of the Nobel Committee uh, that were actually uh, present during this time. Now, in addition, I think, to the development of new therapeutics uh, for Waldenstrom's, there's also been this very important legacy of recognizing that many of the drugs that we had been using to treat Waldenstrom's uh, actually um, could cause other problems, including other cancers. And this was uh, first recognized, you know, in a um, paper that we published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology uh, in 2008. Uh, my colleague Xavier Leloup was the first author, along with uh, Jake Sumerai. And here we followed 463 patients uh, with Waldenstrom, and we looked to see uh, if there were differences in patients who were receiving fludarabine or cladribine compared to patients being treated with other modalities uh, for Waldenstrom's disease. And what we um, came to learn in the study was that the risk of transforming to an aggressive lymphoma went up by sevenfold, and the risk of having either myelodysplasia or acute leukemia, myelodysplasia being a potential precursor to acute leukemia, went up by threefold in patients treated with a nucleoside analog. Uh, important to uh, note in this study that those patients that did transform to an aggressive lymphoma uh, were often uh, salvaged with the use of uh, therapy such as chop rituxin, um, which we typically use to treat uh, patients who have these aggressive uh, lymphomas. But this was a very important uh, study because it began to make us think about the safety, long-term safety, of the therapeutics uh, that we use. This was also a very important study that we published uh, in 2009, where we looked at chop rituxin, which really was um, one of the mainstays of therapy uh, in its time uh, for patients with various lymphomas. Um, today, it continues to be a mainstay of therapy for aggressive lymphomas. But what we were interested in knowing is, do we really need an aggressive regimen like chop rituxin
when in fact, you know, other regimens that don't have adriamycin, which is a very important component of this therapy, which can cause a lot of toxicity, as well as vincristine, which is the V that you see there, uh, which causes neuropathy. And so we wanted to see how patients would do with just uh, CPR, uh, which was uh, cyclophosphamide, prednisone, and rituxan, and not really, you know, needing either the V and vincristine or the O, um, which is the drug Oncovin or adriamycin. And what you see here is, in fact, that even simplifying therapy, the response rates were the same, including major responses. And so I think this was a very important study because it showed us that we could get away with less and have you know, less um, toxicity, less neutropenia, hospitalizations, as well as neuropathy uh, due to the vincristine that we used in both CHOP as well as CVPR. Now, at that time, we also recognized that we were just borrowing therapies from other uh, disease states, you know, whether it was our myeloma colleagues or CLL colleagues or lymphoma colleagues. We were waiting for them to develop therapies, and then basically these were handed down to us. So most of what we were using were hand-me-down therapies. So in, in uh, Los Angeles in 2003, we brought together this very important uh, brain trust of uh, basic scientists and translational scientists. Um, this is the meeting that we had um, as part of the patient uh, summit at UCLA. And what we all felt was critical to our ability to be able to innovate and move the field forward for Waldenstrom's that was that we needed a center of excellence to study this disease, to be able to do the basic science, to understand um, what the genomics were that were driving this disease. And so this was really a very pivotal moment. And of course, in 2005, we were able to have um, the uh, center that we dreamed about, and that was the Bing Center for Waldenstrom's. This was uh, made possible uh, by the generous uh, funding by Dr. Peter Bing. And this here, what you're seeing here is the dedication ceremonies where Harriet Fulbright, who was then the president of the Fulbright Foundation, uh, joined our president, uh, Edward Benz, uh, for the dedication of uh, this uh, center. And here you can see the ribbon cutting with uh, Dr. Peter Bing, who himself is a physician, but also was a trustee and chair of Stanford University at the time, uh, cutting the ribbon um, that dedicated this center of excellence uh, for uh, Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And with this center, we were able to recruit um, a wonderful brain trust, and this included uh, both um, uh, doctors as well as scientists, uh, people from the United States as well as uh, abroad, uh, and um, we had the ability to, to work together to be able to um, understand um, what the disease um, was at the basic science level, but also uh, to understand how many of the drugs that we were using were impacting uh, patients and what we needed to do to be able to innovate and move the field forward. Now that was uh, very nicely accomplished uh, in 2011 when we reported at the American Society of Hematology meeting the discovery of the MYD88 mutation, which was made possible uh, through whole genome sequencing. And uh, this was an effort that was funded by both Dr. Peter Bing, but also by the IWMF. Both uh, entities provided the critical funding that paid for whole genome sequencing, which at that time, it's very important to recognize, was still a very new art. Very few people had used it, and it was very expensive. So being able to have the IWMF and Dr. Bing um, pay for this and provide this critical uh, funding, where 30 patients underwent whole genome sequencing uh, was very critical. And what we discovered uh, as part of this effort um, was, um, you know, um, information that we're still using today. But critical among this was the fact that 93 to 97% of patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia have actually a mutation in the MYD88 gene. And here shown is the uh, whole genome sequencing results that actually show the changes that we detected uh, in the DNA of patients who had Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia that were consistent with this recurring mutation in MYD88. Now, why this was a pivotal discovery 
was that, you know, for the, for the first thing is it gave us a test that we could use to actually help us distinguish Waldenstrom from other things that secrete IgM and look like Waldenstrom's, including marginal zone lymphomas, multiple myeloma, certain CLLs. We did find uh, mediate 8 being expressed in uh, patients that had IgM MGUS, the precursor condition. And the stronger the signal was, um, you know, the more that it determined or predicted that a patient would go on and develop Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And here what you're seeing is PCR analysis, where the stronger the signal is, the earlier you're detected. And so even at lower levels of uh, PCR cycling, you're able to pick this up. And that's why the Waldenstrom's uh, patients are all showing up, you know, here at the bottom. And with this uh, PCR uh, technique that we developed, 93% of patients with Wallenstrom were positive. Important to note, um, the PCR technology that we developed, thanks to our colleague Leanne Zhu, is still used uh, in uh, most medical centers uh, throughout the United States as well as abroad because she had developed uh, this very, very uh, intricate test. Now came along uh, Dr. Uh, Guang Yang in our group who has been instrumental in being able to tell us what exactly MYD88 does. Uh, what he found was that this was a, um, a protein that when it became mutated, it actually turned on BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase, which is the target uh, of uh, ibrutinib as well as other BTK inhibitors like zanubrutinib, acalabrutinib, as well as tirabrutinib. He also made the very interesting discovery that some of these BTK inhibitors like ibrutinib, and now we know also zanubrutinib, also silenced HCK, and HCK is one of those molecules that's actually turned on by mutated mid-88, and this is actually the linchpin that turns on BTK, as well as other survival pathways like ERK and AKT that actually turn on uh, the cell's uh, ability to grow and survive. And more recently with my other colleague, Dr. Manit Munshi in our group, he also uh, discovered that this other molecule, SYK, S-Y-K, that you see here is also turned on and can also turn on other pro-survival pathways. And this is relevant because there are drugs that can actually silence out SYK itself. And so having this very important diagram to understand how MIDI-D functions has been critical to the development of many new therapeutics for Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. Now in this next slide, I show you also the important discovery of yet a second mutation. This was also made possible by the whole genome sequencing project, but involves CXCR4. This is a mutation which I'll tell you about in just a second, but it was made possible because of the wonderful work by Dr. Zachary Hunter in our group, who went back and analyzed the whole genome data, but he created his own algorithms that allowed him to understand that there were these mutations in CXCR4 affecting about 30 to 40% of all Waldenstrom patients. Now, CXCR4 is actually a receptor. I'll show you in just a moment what exactly it does. But almost all the mutations that we found uh, in patients with Waldenstrom's all clustered in that little pigtail that you see at the bottom, including the S338X mutation, uh, which is found in uh, about half of all patients who have CXCR4 mutations. And that's critical because what that mutation does, it actually causes a stop to be introduced. And that whole tail that you see after S338X actually just gets cut off. It gets lobbed off. And that's really important because this part of the tail of this, of this um, gene is very critical for actually regulating how this uh, gene performs. I'm going to show you in just a second what exactly I mean by that. I also want to tell you that in addition to the S338X mutation that we found, there have been a number of other mutations. In fact, now we have over 40 types of CXCR4 mutations that we have cataloged. And this includes uh, the type of mutations that I mentioned with the X that actually cut off part of the protein. But also there are mutations known as frame shift mutations where DNA is either inserted or omitted uh, as a result of the mutation, and this scrambles the code and it makes actually the whole protein uh, very, very different. Now, why this is important is because when you look at how a patient presents with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, um, the type of mutation they have uh, can be very, very instructive. 
if you have the L265P mediated mutation uh, and you have the S338X nonsense mutation, you're going to be the type of patient that's going to come in with a very high IgM and maybe even hyperviscosity crisis. If, on the other hand, you have no mediated mutation, it may be that you're one of those patients that's going to come in with very low uh, disease burden. So this was um, a very important study because it showed us how we could use this mutation information to actually see how a patient would present. Now, I mentioned to you CXCR4 is important. Why is it important? Because it's a receptor for CXCL12. This is a protein released by the bone marrow stroma, and it actually causes the Waldenstrom cells to want to go to the bone marrow. This is the reason why we believe that we see this um, you know, trafficking of Waldenstrom cells to the bone marrow. And when you have a CXCR4 mutation, the antenna that actually signals for CXCL12 remains in the on position and continues to signal. And as a result of that, it actually upregulates a number of proteins and activates them I should say, that actually produces drug resistance against a number of uh, drugs, including the BTK inhibitors. And that's why the kind of modeling that we and others have done around CXCR4 has been very, very uh, instructive. Now, with that information in mind, we were very eager to test BTK inhibitors in uh, Waldenstrom's. We conducted this uh, multi-center study of ibrutinib in relapsed and refractory Waldenstrom patients. Refractory means that the patients didn't respond to their prior therapy. Relapse meant that the patient had progressed after being treated and needed therapy. And patients had to have at least one prior therapy. And so with Ranjan Advani at Stanford and Leah Palumba at Memorial Sloan uh, Kettering, we launched uh, this uh, study treating patients with uh, ibrutinib at the dose of 420 milligrams a day. And we would continue treatment as long as the patient didn't progress or had unacceptable toxicity. And as part of the study, we actually looked at their mid-88 and CXCR4 mutation status. Now, this was a very important study for two reasons. One, it received the first ever breakthrough designation in any oncology indication. And I think we ought to be proud of Waldenstrom's to have been able to achieve that this was achieved in November of 2012 when we presented both our scientific data as well as the early clinical data that we had on ibrutinib uh, to the FDA. But then, of course, came the very important discovery in 2014 um, of the activity of ibrutinib in Waldenstrom's disease. And this led to the first ever approval of a drug for the treatment of Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. This is the FDA meeting we had in June of 2014. And of course, as many of you know, in uh, January of 2015, uh, the approval by the FDA um, you know, came along, and then later in 2015 by the EMA. Now, I just want to update you, since we have the opportunity today to talk about the BTK inhibitors, on the updated activity of ibrutinib in previously treated patients. This is an update of that pivotal trial, now with a median follow-up of 15 months. And I think what the takeaways here are that 90% of those patients responded, even though the patients had a median of two prior therapies. About 80% had a major response, and 30% had a very good partial response, which means at least a 90% decrease in a disease burden. And important here also was the fact that uh, depending on what the patient's genotype was, um, this impacted how they did. If they had no mid 88 mutation, we didn't see really any major responses or VGPRs. If they had the mid 88 mutation and also had on top of that a CXCR4 mutation, you see that the response rates were actually, you know, major response rates are good, but not as good as those patients that have only mid 88 mutation. And this was also true of the VGPRs, the very good partial responses where you can see there the big difference, 47% got a VGPR who only had a mid-88 mutation versus 9% who had both the mid-88 and CXCR4 mutation. And also, important, uh, it took longer to get to a major response, almost by three months uh, with this update. So if you have both uh, mid-88 and CXCR4, it just takes longer to get to that response. That may be critical in some situations, and we'll talk about that at the end of my talk. Also some good news to share is progression-free survival, how long the patients actually 
um, had um, their disease controlled by brutinib at five years, 54% still remain um, with, uh, without progression of their disease, and 87% of the patients were alive. But you can see there are differences in how the patients progressed depending on their mutation status with mediated mutated only patients um, showing the best outcome. 75% were free of progression at five years. Those patients that had both mutations, the progression-free survival was about four years. So that's actually very good when you consider all the other options. And the patients that had no mediated mutation, you know, showed, um, you know, the earliest uh, progression. Now, the update of uh, the study, we also looked at long-term toxicity. There were more atrial um, fibrillation events, uh, now 12%, 12.7% with the longer follow-up um, since we first reported this study in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2015. Um, but I think what's also important to say is that seven out of eight of these patients uh, continued on the abrutinib with medical management. And so developing the atrial fibrillation didn't um, alter uh, treatment uh, for the vast majority of these patients. Now, since that pivotal trial, we also have learned about the INNOVATE study. This is a very interesting study where patients got ibrutinib and rituxan or a placebo plus rituxan. And I want to just uh, emphasize uh, that even in this very important international study, randomized study, which showed that ibrutinib and rituxan did better than placebo and rituxan, that even among those patients who had uh, the mid mutation plus CXCR4, there were fewer major responses, fewer VGPR responses, but the time to get into that response uh, was about the same as those patients that had only the mid mutation. And so this is an important you know, lesson to come by. Now, we also learned in this study, which was updated by Christian Buskey at the ASH 2018 meeting, that the patients that had also the CXCR4 mutation progressed earlier than those that didn't. And so there was yet another study that was showing us that the patients who have CXCR4 mutations tend to progress earlier on ibrutinib-based therapy. Now, I think one of the proud uh, studies that we published, and this has been expanded on by Jorge Castillo in our group, was the role of ibrutinib in patients adding ill syndrome. This is, of course, when the CNS or the brain and the spinal cord become involved with Waldenstrom's disease. And this used to be so difficult to treat. And so with my colleague, Steve Allen, uh, who's down in New York, uh, we published uh, this study on a uh, patient, a mutual patient that we treated with ibrutinib at the dose of 560 milligrams uh, per day. And this patient actually had a very bad case of being Neal syndrome, as you can see here, both by MRI, but also by PET scan, where, where you see the yellow area really representing very um, metabolically active disease. But you can see just a few months later how much has changed with this patient being on ibrutinib. And we were able to also show that we had meaningful drug levels uh, getting into the brain, to the CSF uh, of the brain. Uh, this was a major game changer uh, for big Neal syndrome patients because prior to that, we had to admit the patients and treat them with high-dose chemotherapy, and often we would end up with a lot of toxicity. Now, the ability to actually innovate um, around uh, the development of BTK inhibitors um, has been very important. We now have some new drugs. I know Jorge Castillo has already talked to you about acalabrutinib and zanubrutinib. Um, being new um, introductions to the treatment of Waldenstrom's. I think it's important to keep in mind that there are differences uh, in these drugs because of other targets that they can affect. And this, of course, can affect you know, the outcome in terms of side effect profiling. Um, here in the acalabrutinib study that was published by Roger Owen this past year, um, they found an atrial fibrillation rate of 5%, although their follow-up is much shorter than the one that I reported, and you know, close to that time, our atrial fibrillation rate was also about 5%. But keep in mind, no atrial fibrillation event led to acalabrutinib being withheld or discontinued here. Uh, headaches were very common in the beginning of treating patients with um, acalabrutinib, but these very quickly uh, resolved um, within a few months' time. Now, the big trial that I know Jorge has already talked to you about is the ASPEN trial. This has been this year's big news. 
It's a trial where zanubrutinib was compared to ebrutinib head-on. The uh, follow-up time here is relatively short, about 19 months, but there were some very important lessons that came out of this study, including the big difference in side effect profile with considerably less atrial fibrillation uh, being seen in patients treated with zanubrutinib, uh, less diarrhea, less hemorrhage, uh, less hypertension, but conversely, uh, more neutropenia where the white blood count you know, goes down. However, there were no um, opportunistic uh, infections which were seen with this uh, um, you know, uh, neutropenia among zanubrutinib patients. And so I think at the end of the day, we're going to um, learn about how we're gonna use each and every one of these BTK inhibitors to treat Waldenstrom patients based on their efficacy, which seems to be about uh, a similar level at this point in time, but also looking at the side effect profile. And there may be unique um, areas, you know, where one drug may be preferred over another. For instance, we have a lot of experience now with Bing Neal syndrome uh, with ibrutinib. Uh, this may be, you know, a patient population where we still want to prioritize uh, the treatment of Bing Neal syndrome with ibrutinib. Conversely, we saw that, as Hori has also mentioned to you, uh, more VGPRs and deeper IgM reductions with zanubrutinib. And that may be important in situations where a patient has um, disease that um, is being impacted by the IgM, like the neuropathies, for instance. And so this is why uh, the ability to have multiple BTK inhibitors is very critical uh, to our field. And I think BTK inhibitors are here to stay, and that's why strategies to enhance BTK inhibitors become all the more important. As I already mentioned to you, CXCR4 remains a very important problem. Those patients that have the CXCR4 mutation tend to have less deep responses. We know this also to be true with the zanubrutinib study. Um, and it takes sometimes longer uh, to get into those deeper responses, as we learned also with uh, the ibrutinib study. And so why not go after CXCR4? And here the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society has been very important to us because they helped us fund this study with ulocuplumab, which is an antibody that blocks CXCR4 signaling. And the results from the study are actually very positive. We're gonna hopefully um, report these uh, very shortly at the American Society of Hematology uh, meeting. Uh, but we'll have maybe some uh, chance uh, during our discussion to maybe talk a little bit more about this study. Right now, we are treating patients with another CXCR4 uh, inhibitor, and that is the drug Movarexafor. This is an inhibitor which actually you take by mouth, um, whereas ulacuglimab is an antibody that you have to get by um, intravenous uh, injection. And so here, we have the opportunity of, of perhaps providing all oral therapy. We get you know, a drug like ibrutinib, and you also get Movarexafor as an oral uh, inhibitor. And this uh, trial just uh, has started. It's a very important trial. This is the uh, phase one, two part of the trial, but this will be followed by a randomized trial where patients will get ibrutinib or ibrutinib plus movarexafor who have the CHCR4 mutation and require uh, therapy. Now, I also am very proud about this work that we uh, published back in 2015 um, involving the drug venetoclax. At that time, it was known as ABT199. We were the first to actually show that BCL2 was critical to how ibrutinib function uh, in uh, cells uh, that had the mediated mutation. And these are Waldenstrom cells that you see here. And what you see where the arrows are shown, the first set of arrows where it says ABT and IB, uh, is that in cells that were either had no CXCR4 mutation, those wild type cells, or those that had CXCR4 mutation, the S338X that we engineered, that if you added both drugs together, you actually caused all these apoptosis markers, markers of cell death, uh, to go up dramatically over each drug, you know, individually. And this was very important because we know that BCL2, which is what venetoclax targets, is highly expressed in Waldenstrom cells. And this is an anti-apoptosis protein. It actually defends the cells from dying against drug insult. And so if you can knock down you know, a protein that's actually defending those cells and add another drug that's actually promoting death, then as we see here, 
we have the ability to kill those cells off. And that's why the study that Hori Castillo is now doing uh, in our group, combining ibrutinib and venetoclax, is very, very critical. Uh, we hope that this will lead to deeper responses in patients with Waldenstrom, but also this um, uh, treatment program is for two years, and then drugs all stop. Instead of being able to um, give drug, you know, um, for long periods of time, you know, until progression, we have perhaps the opportunity to only treat patients for two years' time and then stop. And that's why I think this is a very critical study, uh, and we're really looking forward to the outcome. Now, another very important study that the IWMF has funded is to look at resistance mechanisms to ibrutinib. And these are two critical papers I want to show you where the IWMF support is strongly acknowledged. And let me tell you at least some of the lessons that we learned from this study are now being purposed in other diseases. So it's wonderful when you've got a orphan disease like Waldenstrom being able to teach um, people in other disease groups valuable lessons. And so let's talk a little bit about resistance. First of all, there is this mutation uh, in BTK that was discovered by Lian Zhu in Waldenstrom patients, which is um, in the amino acid cysteine 481. This is important to remember because that's where ibrutinib binds to BTK. And in many patients, we found actually mutations in cysteine 481 that converted that cysteine to some other amino acid and ibrutinib no longer was able to bind. And uh, we saw, in fact, in some Waldenstrom's patients, they not only had one type of cysteine mutation, they had multiple different types. So you had all these different resistant clones emerging in these ibrutinib treated cells. Now comes the very exciting science. And that is that when we saw in the Waldenstrom patients um, that had the uh, BTK cis mutations, it usually was always a, a small minority of the cells that had the actual mutation, and yet the patients were progressing on ibrutinib. And my colleagues who work in CLL saw the same exact thing, and so there was always this mystery as to what was going on. And so Jaji Chen in our group, along with uh, his mentor Guang Yang, did these very elaborate experiments. They use what we call co-culture dishes, where you can actually put uh, cells on both sides of a membrane and see what happens. And when they put cells that had no BTK mutation, the ones that are shown in green, along with uh, the yellow cells that also had no BTK mutation, and they added ibrutinib, everything died. But if they engineered the cells to express that BTK mutation, the cis481 mutation, and they put it on one side, the red ones here, and then they added ibrutinib, they all lived, including the cells that didn't have it. And so there was something going through the porous membrane that was making the cells on the other side of the membrane resistant to ibrutinib. And what we discovered was that interleukin-6 and interleukin-10 uh, was actually being shed by those cells that actually created uh, resistance in the cells that didn't actually have the mutation. And that was a very important discovery because uh, we were able to work out the pathway, the uh, ERK pathway was identified, and we were able to show that if you did, in fact, use a blocking drug to ERK, you could actually reverse uh, this uh, resistance mechanism. These days, we've embarked on also looking at non-covalent BTK inhibitors. Uh, these are drugs that actually bind to BTK, but at sites other than the BTK cis481 site. And uh, at our institution, we're uh, working on LOXO305, that actually targets BTK um, at uh, G473 and K483. So these are very removed sites from the cysteine 481 uh, that is responsible for resistance to ibrutinib. That same site, by the way, is the same site that zanubrutinib, acalabrutinib, and tirabrutinib bind. So that mutation would also affect those drugs. So having these non-covalent inhibitors uh, being developed uh, is very important and gives us a chance to actually continue to treat patients who have a BTK cis481 mutation with BTK inhibition. Now, the IWMF has also uh, funded a very important study, which is uh, looking at um, the development of uh, inhibitors that target HCK itself. As you remember, I said earlier that HCK is actually turned on, it's upregulated by mid-88, and in turn, HCK is what actually turns on BTK itself. So if you can actually target HCK, 
you might be able to shut down BTK, but also shut down the other pro-survival pathways, ERK, as well as uh, AKT. ERK actually is the one that releases IL-6 and other inflammatory uh, cytokines. And so if you can actually shut down HCK, you might get ETK, but also all these other very important uh, survival and inflammatory pathways. And so with the IWMF's uh, support, we did in fact uh, develop with our Harvard Medicinal Chemistry colleagues um, a lead molecule known as KIN8194. We just presented this data at the American Society of Hematology meeting in 2019. And what I'll tell you what was very exciting is we actually put mid 88 mutated uh, tumor cells uh, into mice. We either gave them um, you know, a, um, a placebo control, we gave them ibrutinib, or we gave them KIN8194. And what you'll see there is that the animals that got the vehicle control uh, died you know, very, very quickly within a few weeks of time, and their tumors uh, grew. Uh, the animals that were on ibrutinib actually did have uh, extended survival, um, but these tumors also began to grow and the animals ultimately started dying off a few weeks after that. And then what we show here is that KIN8194 animals actually had suppression of their tumor uh, and showed uh, the best survival. And in fact, in about half of the mice that were treated uh, in this study, um, these um, mice, even after the drug was stopped, went on for another 12 weeks uh, without developing any tumor. And so operationally, uh, they were actually cured. Now, there's also this model that I'm very excited to share with you, where we actually put in the BTK cis mutation, the one that creates the resistance to ibrutinib. And what we saw here was that the animals that got treated with ibrutinib or the vehicle control, all their tumors grew very, very fast. But when you treated the animals with either the KIN8194, either at 50 milligrams or 75 milligrams, you were able to suppress the tumor growth, particularly at the higher dose. And this uh, resulted in extended survival uh, for these by mice uh, by many, many weeks. And so we were able to show that we could overcome the resistance associated with the BTK cis481 mutation, uh, which is responsible for ibrutinib resistance. In the last couple of slides, I just want to talk about um, you know, uh, Waldenstrom's where we have not been able to uh, demonstrate a mid-88 mutation. Um, thanks to IWMF funding, we embarked on doing whole exome sequencing that actually identified a number of very interesting uh, new mutations uh, in uh, these uh, cells, uh, including the one XR1, as well as other mutations that, that activate the NF-kappa-B pathway. But surprisingly, when you look at how these mutations actually uh, transactivate the cell, um, this is what we call principal component analysis, where we take the 500 highest you know, expressing genes. And what we saw, in fact, was that their pattern of expression um, very much overlapped those of patients um, with the mid mutation. This, of course, one would expect because you know, after all, this is Waldenstrom's disease, um, but many of these uh, other types of mutations actually have a way of what we call phenocopying or acting similar to what we see as part of the mediated signaling cascade. Now, the one thing to keep in mind, and this explains why we don't see those deep responses with uh, ibrutinib in patients that have no mediated mutation, is that almost all of these mutations are below BTK. That's where you see the little lightning bolt that's where those uh, mutations have been discovered. So at least we have an understanding of uh, both the mutations responsible for mediated wild type disease, again, no mutation, so we call it wild type, um, and we also begin to understand why BTK inhibitors may have a limited role in treating these patients. I do wanna share with you also where the IWMF has been very um, supportive along with the Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia Foundation of Canada, and that is in supporting the 300 project. This is a very ambitious project, where, uh, which we began in 2007. Uh, the aim of this uh, project was to sequence and track 300 symptomatic untreated Waldenstrom's patients. And in doing so, we were determined to map out their DNA, RNA, as well as what we call the epigenome, all the regulatory machinery that helps you know, control how DNA codes for RNA. 
And we wanted to understand the impact on the disease presentation, the course of disease, as well as survival of these patients, and also hoping to develop new targeted therapies based on the mutation profiling uh, from individual patients um, you know, and their uh, genomic uh, mutations. Lastly, I just want to um, um, leave with you the notion that these uh, genomic um, endeavors are helping us not only in uh, developing new treatment strategies, uh, but also in being able to make specific decisions about treatment for individual patients. And so when a patient does present and has just a mediated A mutation, you know, we'll prioritize a BTK inhibitor because as we saw in the data from the pivotal study, these patients actually do quite well for long periods of time. If they have both mutations, we're gonna to wanna to learn if the CXCR4 mutation is causing changes such as hyperviscosity that need immediate therapy, in which case we'll prioritize bendamustine or a proteasome inhibitor. But if they're in no rush, then we'll give a BTK inhibitor plus rituxan because that addition of rituxan causes earlier responses to occur. And if they have no mediated A mutation, then we'll prioritize either bendamustine or a proteasome inhibitor. And um, because we know that BTK inhibitors, at least ibrutinib from our uh, own studies, has a limited role. And the same is also true of patients who have relapsed or are refractory to their prior therapy. We can use a similar schema to make informed uh, treatment decisions. So at the end of the day, uh, the genomic discoveries in Waldenstrom's, which we are grateful to the IWMF for their support in being able to make these discoveries, to translate them, uh, to look at them in clinical practice, has given us the opportunity to now advance not only new drugs, such as uh, ibrutinib and zanubrutinib, acalabrutinib, furabrutinib, but also the CXCR4 inhibitors and our ability to also leverage drugs like venetoclax along with these BTK inhibitors. And at the end of the day, not only will we have new drugs, but we'll also have an algorithm for customizing or personalizing the individual care of patients with Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia. And with that, I'd like to thank the IWMF for having me in this year's forum. And I look forward to speaking with you uh, during the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Trion, for this interesting perspective on the history of this rare disease and for reviewing the progress of research in Waldenstrom's. I think that all of us affected in one form or another by WM are truly appreciative of the enormous efforts made by you and your very capable colleagues at the Bing Center for Waldenstrom's Macroglobulinemia at, at the Dana-Farber Cancer Center. And in fact, we are all appreciative of all the talented and dedicated researchers worldwide. <clears throat> now, uh, we're going to have a few questions from the audience for Dr. Trion. And in fact, our first question, if Dr. Trion is ready, <clears throat> is, has I'm there here. been... Oh, thank you, Steve, That's nice to uh, hear, hear your lovely voice. <clears throat> has, has there been any research on delaying treatment until symptoms warrant versus treatment of increasing IgM numbers? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So, you know, we have looked at therapies that were meant to um, keep patients from progressing. So those uh, studies were really focused on delaying progression of disease so that patients didn't really warrant, you know, more intense therapy. Uh, they included some drugs uh, that, you know, like Viagra. They included uh, sildenafil, uh, that's Viagra. They included simvastatin, um, which is a, uh, a drug that affects, you know, cholesterol. Uh, these had all been shown to have some potential activity. Uh, we have also done preclinical studies that have looked at uh, components of green tea, EGCG specifically. So, so there have been actually studies looking at therapeutics that could prevent uh, progression. None of these, I have to say at this point, you know, were, were shown to be, um, you know, uh, effective um, or at least not effective for long periods of time. Therefore, I really wouldn't put any uh, value uh, in making any decisions based on these attempts. But, you know, to the, to the question that's been asked, yes, research has been done. Uh, 
Now, the other question about increasing IgM is very important because typically we don't treat patients um, based on the IgM advancing in and of itself. Usually, we want to couple that with symptoms or a drop in hemoglobin as opposed to looking at the IgM per se, and that's why it's not in our official um, consensus panel recommendations for starting treatment. However, that being said, uh, typically when patients are at 6,000 milligrams per deciliter or higher, there is a much higher risk of hyperviscosity crisis. And therefore, based on the work that's been done predominantly at our institution, you know, we would advocate for treatment of somebody whose IgM may be at 6,000 or higher. Now, don't, don't take these numbers as absolute, but just know that uh, in that range we become very, very concerned. And we just don't want somebody to present with loss of vision as their first, you know, um, manifestation of high IgM level. Okay, thank you very much. That's a, that's a great answer to a great question. The next question is, um, is there a medication or a treatment, I suppose, we could say for Waldenstrom patients with CXCR4 mutation since ibrutinib does not work so well in this particular case? Yeah, this is a great question. I think we addressed it a little bit in my presentation, but we just concluded uh, a study looking at the monoclonal antibody ulocuplumab. So it's an antibody like rituxan. Uh, it's able to bind to CXCR4, and it prevents CXCR4 from engaging with the protein that normally turns it on. Uh, that trial actually is a very uh, positive one. We were very excited by the readout. We showed we could get patients much quicker into a response, even deeper responses. Unfortunately, the sponsor of that trial, the pharmaceutical company, has decided to discontinue the manufacture of ulocuplumab. That's because they were really targeting it for treating patients with acute leukemia, and they didn't get a signal there. And for a rare disease like Waldenstrom's, they just didn't believe that they could make the case to continue its development. But in its place, there's a pharmaceutical company here in Boston called X4 Pharmaceuticals, which has actually developed uh, an oral uh, antagonist or blocker of CXCR4. It goes by the name of Movarexa4. It's taken by mouth uh, once a day. And uh, we are running this trial now. Uh, so we're very excited about this trial because, quite honestly, it's an innovation. You know, beyond having to have the patient come into the clinic to get an antibody, this way you send the patient home with ibrutinib um, and uh, movarexapor. And, and so I think this is going to be a very exciting trial. And, you know, if anybody is interested in this trial, uh, we just actually started it very recently. Um, you have to have CXCR4 and you have to, you know, need treatment. Uh, and uh, the patients will get both ibrutinib as well as molarexa uh, as part of this trial. That's wonderful news. As as from Dr. Castillo's presentation this morning, I'm sure there are many new treatments soon to be available for for all of us. Uh, the next question is: Any updates on the latest genetic testing or recommendations for families who have strong history of blood cancers, including a Waldenstrom's? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, as you know, we've been working on this now for just about 20 years' time. My colleague, um, you know, Mary McMaster down at uh, the NIH has been working on it even longer. Um, thanks to a collaboration that we have with Mary, uh, we've provided her with uh, DNA samples from over 1,000 Waldenstrom's patients, and uh, those are currently being analyzed. Uh, in addition, in our um, hands, we're also looking at tumor uh, differences uh, at multi multiple different layers to try to figure out, you know, how these are different. There are some very interesting mutations that we have seen. We've actually narrowed it down to uh, a small handful that actually may give us uh, the, um, the readout as to why particular families are at risk for a familial Waldenstrom's. Um, keep in mind, there's two patterns of how patients present with familial Waldenstrom's. You have families where it's only Waldenstrom. You'll see multiple generations. Um, we actually had uh, three generations, you know, the grandfather, father, and uh, two of the grandchildren. Um, in Iceland, they reported five generations of uh, Waldenstrom. 
So that's one pattern where you just see only Waldenstrom. Uh, this is the more uncommon type of familial Waldenstrom. The other pattern is we see families that have all types of lymphomas, CLL, even multiple myeloma, and uh, you have, you know, the brother or sister with one of these other, um, you know, ailments uh, along with Waldenstrom. And we have uh, several such families. In fact, we care for about 250 families right now. And uh, these families um, have been very, very generous with providing us with their genetic material. And it's going to be a very interesting uh, analysis going forward because when we talk about genetic testing, it's multiple layers. You know, you've got DNA that codes for RNA. You've got the epigenome, which is extremely complicated. It's the software that drives how our DNA gets coded for. And at all these levels, uh, we have the opportunity for discovery. So I just want to acknowledge, actually, the uh, Orzag uh, and Kitchen families uh, for stepping up and providing a specific uh, funding just so that we can get at this particular question. Okay, very interesting indeed. Uh, my next question, I will apologize ahead of time, is a bit obscure. Is there any further research regarding ibrutinib and its possible mitigating of the cytokine storms that occur from the virus? And the virus, I take it, uh, Dr. Trion, would be the COVID virus? Yes, yes. So in April, uh, we, um, we published the first report of the possible protective effects of BTK inhibitors uh, on patients who had been infected with COVID-19. Uh, and uh, these were all Waldenstrom patients who were on ibrutinib. Uh, they were on ibrutinib for various lengths of time, but you know, in the order of many, many months. And um, during the beginning of the pandemic here in the United States, uh, these uh, patients became infected and what was very interesting about the patients who were on full-dose uh, ibrutinib was that even though they got the cough, they got the fever associated with the COVID-19, none of them had the respiratory distress, none of them required oxygen, and by and large, these patients had a relatively um, modest course associated with the COVID-19 infection. Now, there was one patient uh, on this study uh, who was on uh, low-dose uh, ibrutinib. This was because the patient was having um, some um, uh, joint pains and aches associated with the ibrutinib. And uh, this patient um, had his uh, ibrutinib held, um, you know, because of concerns that it might be suppressing the immune system. Um, long and short of it is the patient became more short of breath uh, during this uh, period of time and um, ended up in the hospital. Uh, the patient was tried on different uh, therapeutics to try to help him, um, you know, chloric, hydrochloroquine, azithromycin. There was also the tocilizumab IL-6 antibody. Um, the, the, that antibody provided some relief for a few days, but his symptoms became worse, became more short of breath, and ended up on the ventilator. And when that patient was put back on full-dose uh, ibrutinib, all his parameters improved. His um, oxygenation improved. Uh, one of the very important markers for following inflammation went down. You know, a day afterwards, he was uh, off of the ventilator. A day after that, he was off oxygen and was able to be uh, discharged home. Um, there's a lot of, um, you know, preclinical data as well as other clinical uh, data that says that uh, BTK inhibitors can be of benefit here. Uh, Janice Gabrilov reported such benefit in CLL patients. A study that was done at the NIH and just published uh, this past June um, showed, in fact, that uh, patients getting the acalabrutinib uh, BTK inhibitor, uh, most of them benefited who were hospitalized on oxygen and even some of the patients on a ventilator. So very much confirming our initial uh, observations. And they also showed that BTK was really part of that very important story. Um, we also know that there's animal research uh, where um, mice were subjected to um, a very lethal strain of uh, influenza virus, um, which um, uniformly all died. But the animals that were treated with ibrutinib all survived. And in fact, when you know, detailed studies were done, it sh they showed that in fact the inflammation of the lung 
was uh, you know blocked uh, by the brutinib and so were all the cytokines many of which overlap with the ones that we see now with COVID-19. So long and short, we have clinical data. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, a lot of basic science data, a lot of it which has been funded by the IWMF. So you should all be extremely proud um, because we were able to repurpose, you know, that literature. Much of it was created because of Waldenstrom's because we have the mediated eight mutation that we talked about today is actually in the same pathway that the, that the virus can actually trigger these inflammatory cytokines. The cells that actually are responsible are cells that actually have these toll receptors with MED88 and BTK in them. And they're the cells that actually are the cells that are binding to the COVID virus and starting everything. And so you've got, you know, nature, which has these signal pathways, these circuits that are used to turn on inflammation. And then you've got a mutation like in Waldenstrom's that actually turns on the same circuitry. Uh, and so our ability to repurpose that knowledge, much of which was created with the um, help of the IWMF, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, we were able to repurpose it uh, to, um, to look at COVID-19. And so we have now uh, a couple of prospective trials that are ongoing. These are predominantly in non-cancer patients uh, with COVID-19 related um, pulmonary distress. Uh, two of these studies um, uh, include one with ibrutinib, one with zanubrutinib, and our uh, colleagues at the NIH are also doing a study with um, AstraZeneca with acalabrutinib. So we've got multiple different trials, but, uh, but I do want you, take credit for this, um, I do want you to feel good because that shot heard around the world really did start with the work that the IWMF and even LLS were able to fund. The other important thing that came out of that paper was the fact that a lot of doctors wanted to stop BTK inhibitors because they were just concerned uh, about, you know, the fact that uh, their patients could be uh, adversely impacted. Uh, the idea that, you know, the BTK inhibitors might have been, might have been protective um, was also leveraged by a lot of um, clinicians in making decisions about their patients about continuing a BTK inhibitor. And of course, you know, multiple other papers have come out since. Well, that certainly is an excellent uh, answer to a very timely question indeed. I should state from the outset that I know we're a little bit over time here for those of, of you who are listening in or, or watching, uh, but uh, since the uh, actual uh, slide lecture went a little bit over, I've taken liberty to try to extend this particular session for uh, until um, uh, for another 10 minutes or so, <clears throat> if that's okay with everyone. Uh, my next question, Imbruvica works by blocking the enzyme that creates the Waldenstrom blood cells. This is part of the question. Does that mean that I am no longer creating new cells and the ones in my bone marrow have been there for years and will continue to reside there? Okay. Over to you, Steve. Yeah, it's a bit of a... Yeah, I'm trying to uh, just make sure I understand the um, the question. I think the, the question that is being asked is um, that, you know, I think the concern is, are, are you blocking the BTK enzyme and can you make, you know, can you make additional BTK because it's important? And the answer is yes. I mean, what the uh, ibrutinib does is it actually blocks the activity of the BTK uh, enzyme. It binds to it in a co what we call a covalent matter. It sticks so hard that it doesn't come off. And the same is true also for zanubrutinib, for acalabrutinib, and even another BTK inhibitor, tirabrutinib, that's being looked at for WM patients in Japan. Uh, and, uh, but you're able to make BTK every day. Those, those, uh, that protein is being constantly um, being, you know, um, remade, and that's why you need to be on ibrutinib because the new protein that's made needs to be inhibited. All right. Uh, another interesting question, uh, not applicable to me, but um, why can you not have children while taking ibrutinib? Well, you can have children. I, I guess, you know, I have three, so I can relate <laughs> completely to the question. Um, the point is that there really isn't enough safety data to know that the molecule may not act as a teratogen. And in fact, keep in mind that when some of the preclinical 
studies you know, are done, they're usually done with super high levels of drug, much higher than they would be done in, um, in, in individuals and in patients. Uh, and sometimes you can see a signal associated with that. And that's why you, know, you don't really wanna take a chance. And we all go back to the drug thalidomide you know, as an example where you know, we all thought it would be safe you know, for, for people to take um, it was a very good antiemetic. It, you know, it prevented nausea and vomiting. And then women, uh, you know, who were childbearing got the drug and children were born with focal melia, without arms or limbs. And so this is why um, the FDA and, um, you know, many of the pharmaceuticals will, will do everything they can to prohibit, you know, uh, their drug being um, in a situation where, where somebody could become pregnant and, um, you know, have such a uh, horrible outcome. Of course. This is my second to last question, uh, Dr. Trion. Uh, a bit of a loaded question, but um, in your opinion, what looks to be the most promising immunotherapy for Waldenstrom's? Yeah, this is a very loaded question. Um, and, and I, you know, I think one needs to have a lot of insight. Um, our priorities now as a field are really to maximize BTK inhibitors, uh, to maximize um, the BCL2 inhibitors like venetoclax, and to also maximize the CXCR4 inhibitors. And I think it's really important for the audience to know that these have been rationally arrived at. You know, this is what the genome or transcriptome has told us is critical. And there are other targets as well that are going to be revealed uh, that are going to be also acted upon. Um, immunotherapy has largely been developed in other lymphomas where that kind of target intelligence doesn't exist uh, or where the disease is aggressive in such a way that the first line of therapeutics uh, or even second line haven't been effective. And that's why the priority for developing immunotherapy for Waldenstrom's hasn't been as high as maximizing that for BTK inhibitors and BCL2 inhibitors and CXCR4 inhibitors. Um, as a result, we, you know, CAR T cell therapy really hasn't been aggressively pursued in Waldenstrom so far. Keep in mind that, you know, there's a lot of toxicity associated with these, um, you know, approaches. And these are not, uh, for the most part, curative. You know, they'll get, for some patients, you know, long-term responses. But on average, in myeloma patients, it's about a year. This is why um, we've invested uh, so far our, our talents and skills in developing the inhibitors um, that have come out of um, you know, what we've learned from the genome. Well, thank you, Dr. Trion. You're very generous with your time. I just have uh, one more question for you. Uh, Please. I have Waldenstrom's with kidney amyloid slash pleural effusion, getting bortezomib currently. Any new developments in treatment for people like me? And I take it that would mean people with the amyloid um, uh, variant. Yeah, no, this is a great question. You know, we have been uh, studying amyloid, and there are other great centers of excellence that have also, um, like, you know, the, the folks in Pavia in Italy, um, who have really done a lot of wonderful basic science work around uh, amyloid. That's Dr. Uh, Giampaolo Merlini's group in particular. Um, so we, we often look to them for guidance. Um, we do use proteasome inhibitors, particularly bortezomib, uh, for treating patients as our first line. Usually we use the Cyborg D uh, regimen that combines cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and other drugs. Although, you know, again, we tend to individualize these, so I don't want, you know, folks drawing broad conclusions. Um, and typically what we will do is we will then consider transplant, autologous transplant for patients. Because, you know, here with amyloid is that you really got to stomp out all protein production. And these are the light chains that are made by the Waldenstrom cells that have a particular kink in them that turns them into fibrils that are very hard to get rid of. So as a result, it's like chewing gum getting stuck in hair, except the hair is the organs. And once it's in there, it's very, very hard to get rid of. So what you want to do is you want to maximize um, stopping the uh, light chain from being produced by the Waldenstrom cells. And bortezomib does a great job of that. And we, we in many cases, will consolidate with autologous transplant. 
Disappointingly, the BTK inhibitors, at least at first glance, didn't show um, an impact. You know, we, we got hematological remissions, but not really uh, clinical remissions in patients with amyloid. So we've deprioritized um, their use uh, at this point in time. And I just want to clearly say that, you know, I think this is still a very highly unmet, you know, area and need. I know uh, Maury Gertz um, has a particular interest um, as well as uh, Andy Wenchelar in the UK in helping to further therapeutics uh, for patients with amyloid. And, uh, you know, we'll be looking to their progress uh, for guidance. Yeah. This will conclude our questions. I want to thank Dr. Trion uh, for his participation in our virtual ed forum and for answering our questions so well. Um, <clears throat> As an aside, I will remind you that Dr. Trion will be back tomorrow for the live one-and-a-half-hour Ask the Doctor panel, a session that you do not want to miss. This concludes today's presentation. Thank you so much, Steve. appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. We'd like to thank our sponsors for making these educational sessions possible. By Gene, Selector Biosciences, Janssen, pardon me, Pharmacyclics, Redway Foundation, and X4 Pharmaceuticals. Uh, lastly, the IWMF is extremely grateful to all of you in the audience uh, for being with us today and welcome you to explore the Exhibits and Resource Center. We hope uh, that you will join us again uh, tomorrow for day two of the 2020 IWMF Virtual Educational Forum. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you again, Dr. Trion. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thanks.